Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. And uh, hello, everyone. And uh, I want to also join my colleagues in thanking the RGSL and uh, all the partners of uh, advanced program and uh, the intensive program of uh, law and economics. Uh, in our cases and showcases, uh, the, the, today's event uh, showcases and to a large extent the success of this program and also um, it is uh, further uh, tested by the individual stories of uh, every participant of this program in their respective uh, professional careers. If you, if you could please um, uh, check if my presentation is, uh, if you could see my presentation here, yeah. uh, right, um, as, uh, uh, as it has been uh, uh, known for the, excuse me just for a moment, uh, the content, uh, the, the substance of my presentation relates to the funda fundamental constitutional principle, which is um, the con uh, principle and the obligation which flows from the rule of law is uh, the, the obligation of rational lawmaking. And um, the purpose uh, of my paper is to see the recent regulatory reform in Georgia through the prism of all these constitutional principle and the obligation of rational lawmaking if it has the potential of success in uh, the context of Georgia and, and the future. I, the, the substance of my paper is mainly uh, divided into three parts, the contents. The first one uh, delves into the correlation uh, between democracy and the rule of law and it, uh, the, the intention of the first subchapter is to provide with uh, the respective theoretical argument uh, about the rationality requirements in lawmaking and to illustrate uh, certain substantive and procedural requirements which are developed uh, in theory. The next uh, subchapter uh, relates to the, ju the jurisprudential arguments, which has evolved over time, mainly in uh, the German jurisprudence by the German Federal Constitutional Court of Germany, and also um, this uh, uh, subsection, subchapter of the paper would uh, further deconstruct the uh, perspectives of rational lawmaking as you can see from the slide, the ex ante, both ex ante and ex post perspectives. And uh, lastly, the paper would uh, overview the regulatory reform in Georgia and would provide main uh, the scope, basically, and the legal framework of the reform, and also would uh, uh, discuss the, uh, the, the perspectives for, of, the, of success uh, of this reform in Georgia. So, um, as it is mostly uh, known for uh, the constitutional lawyers and uh, I think uh, uh, the recent events, both on the European continent and beyond, can uh, basically uh, breach this argument, there is an uneasy and very difficult relationship between a democracy and the rule of law. Uh, well, from the very Mm -hmm. uh, simplistic argument, uh, the, 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 on the one hand, we have uh, representative, the, the instruments and processes of representative democracy, whereby uh, through the electoral process, the electoral uh, majority is uh, chosen by the people and with the mandate to govern uh, in, in the duration of a certain period of time. But on the other hand, there is a, a specific constitutional framework which combines Argue um, as, it, as it is argued uh, else everywhere, uh, certain uh, both procedural and substantive elements of uh, democracy, and this, in, on, on the other hand, is uh, inherent uh, part of the rule of law principle. We uh, there, there is a um, uh, in in the, uh, in the post World War Second era was. The European continent has seen the devastating effects of the World War II. The 
concept of limited government and the concept of liberalism, uh, which uh, basically has its foundation on the civil liberties and civil uh, political rights and freedoms, uh, has become more and more prevalent over, over the decades uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. And this is the, the major uh, one could see, I'm not, I don't mean to uh, in any way uh, oversimplicate this issue, oversimplify this issue, but the main argument uh, when we talk about the correlation coexistence of the rule of law and democracy in the modern government, modern governance, basically as illustrated by uh, various famous uh, researchers and scientists in this respect as, as it's uh, uh, as, as you, the audience may see on this slide by working or wheel. On the one hand, there is uh, substantive arguments of human rights, the, li the principles of liberal liberalism, which are enshrined in the constitutional framework. And with these foundational principles, what we get is the Dem democratic government ele with the uh, elected with the, the support of the electoral majority that it that uh, the uh, majority of the day may get uh, through the pros electoral processes and the idea of a constrained government which means that uh, the elected majorities of the day are bound by certain principles which enshrined in the constitution but which flow from the uh, principles of uh, liberalism and uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms. And uh, the takeaway from the first chapter is that the coexistence, coexistence of two, those, both of these values in, uh, in a large sense help to legitimize the modern governance and uh, to ensure its viability. And uh, if we uh, analyze the recent uh, tensions um, on the European continent or elsewhere, where we see uh, uh, an uh, uneasy uh, attempt, a relationship and, and the attempts by the electoral majorities, elect, elected majorities of the day to uh, undermine the principles of rule of law, this, in fact, one might argue that this, in fact, would not serve well to the existing constitutional framework and uh, in the end this may you know, may in high probability lead to uh, serious changes and one may see, say that revolutionary changes uh, if they uh, persist with the proposed uh, uh, undermining reforms that uh, uh, has been suggested uh, I mean uh, uh, the instances of uh, um, uh, reforms that have been propagated both by the couple of Central European countries, and I don't want to name it, name it, and also this is very relevant in our region, in the Eastern Partnership region. Uh, obviously, I don't want to give any particular examples. Uh, this may be a good subject for discussion uh, once we finish the presentation. The next um, chapter, uh, the second chapter of my paper, basically on Pax, uh, the normative framework of rationality in lawmaking. And here we have uh, also the normative framework, which is largely uh, um, based on the famous uh, 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 scientists of the rule of law, the, uh, the very principles that is illustrated on, on the slide the eight principles of uh, Ron Fuller, the famous uh, uh, claimed professor of law in this respect, the generality, publicity, prospectivity, and intelligi intelligibility, consistency, practicability, stability, and congruence. Those principles are in a larger sense, uh, the goes to the heart of the modern understanding of the rule of law. This, on the one hand, is the procedural, one, may, one might argue, the procedural aspect of understanding of the kind of modern rule of law uh, system. On the, on the other hand, as I've already discussed, uh, we have substantive understanding of the rule of law, which, it, which finds its uh, source in the uh, 
in the, the inherent principles of more liberalism, which goes, which as Fuller uh, famously illustrated in, in its work, uh, has the moral dimension of law, and it, it, it is very much tied to the principles of proportionality and equality in the modern understanding of the rule of law. Uh, proportionality as, uh, is very well known to the lawyers, it, it, the principle that basically permeates every aspect of uh, legal uh, work. Uh, it is in, in, uh, basically um, involves the balancing of uh, two or more uh, policy choices, one in the course of the decision making, and on the other hand, uh, uh, requirement of the principle of equality uh, in, in basically involves the requirement of consistency while legislating consistency in the legal framework uh, when uh, the legislature passes the laws and also consistency in uh, passing and making the rules and in consistently applying them to to its to their uh, to its addressees to the individuals uh, this is the uh, idea behind the equality here. Um, another uh, requirement and another aspect of the constitutional standard of rationality in lawmaking is uh, uh, the monitoring mechanism, which also flows from the well, from flows from what I've discussed already, uh, is the ex post monitoring and correction of legislation. This is the requirement that uh, has been. Um, uh, developed by the jurisprudence of the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany, and it has evolved elsewhere where it uh, has had the perspective, well, it has transposed uh, in uh, the uh, European systems, either in jurisprudence or less likely in jurisprudence actually, but more in the uh, legislative, uh, for legislative framework, which regulates the lawmaking procedures uh, in, uh, in various countries, but the, but the idea of um, having uh, an idea of uh, envisaging the requirement of consistency and equality and uh, consistency and uh, correction of uh, laws uh, has uh, the practical understanding has its practical dimension, which basically, in the very detailed analysis of. Uh, detailed analysis conducted over the years, over the decades actually, by the German Constitutional Court has been identified and which has basically, which we will see in the Georgian uh, example and obviously Georgian example has its, uh, the Georgian regulatory reform is largely based upon the European experience, um, has been basically developed by the uh, German in the German jurisprudence, as it is uh, illustrated on the slide. There's a, there are five stages in the in the course of the lawmaking where the, the legislature, the policymakers at, at large, had to give due account to in the beginning, initially in the initial phase, the pro to problem formulation and determination of objectives, which which is key uh, for the success of a particular. A legislative uh, proposal, and then uh, the uh, then then comes the determination of facts, the prognosis, the evaluation, and decision. And uh, ex post aspect is monitoring and rectification. In all these aspects, uh, there there is a uh, the respective legislative tool that uh, is employed in the current understanding of better lawmaking, and we, we see the. Impact assessment tool, which is uh, the most uh, one may one may see the most famous and most la um, popular uh, instrument adopted everywhere um, in the most of the countries uh, around the globe, um, and one may see the effective instrument in this regard. Uh, this, uh, but it involves, but it it uh, also covers the, the different stages of uh, lawmaking. Uh, both it starts from the determination of facts, but it lasts to, until the final decision is reached whether to adopt this, uh, the proposed uh, legislative solution or whether to pass the proposed legislative, whether to adopt the proposed legislative solution or pass the legislative um, instrument 
or whether to basically uh, try to deregulate. There is no, there is always there. It is key for the better regulation agenda as developed as uh, um, uh, developed by the in, in the European understanding. It's that there is there should not be a predefined objective of regulation once the policy making process get, is started. So at the stage of problem formulation and determination of facts in the in the first two stages uh, the re, re, the appropriate research the appropriate assessment should be made whether the legislative involvement the legislative solution is needed at all so the one uh, the process might even end at the first uh, couple of stages if the uh, if the facts do not basically substantiate this proposed legislative reform. Now, in, uh, the, in respect of Georgia, basically, and one may say that it was a long overdue that uh, Georgia has uh, only a year before been able to pass the, uh, the respective reform and basically to introduce the regulatory, evidence-based regulatory um, pro uh, reform in, uh, in uh, Georgia. And, there, there's a there's a context that's very relevant here. There's contextual background, which basically um, uh, one obviously date, it dates back long before the well, long before 2014, when the association agreement was concluded between uh, Georgia and the European Union. And in, the one of the basic substantive pillars, the principles on which upon which the association agreement is founded, is the principles of good governance, democracy, and the rule of law, as we've already discussed, as I've already discussed, uh, the normative framework and theoretical arguments behind the rule of law principle. It, it's not. Uh, uh, it is thereby clear what is the what is the requirement of the association agreement between Georgia and uh, the uh, European Union. So, the European Union and the European Commission uh, through the dialogue with the, uh, through the dialogue procedure with Georgia has supported a lot Georgian government to basically uh, draw up a plan and then to introduce the respective regulation and basically to uh, provide uh, financial um, and also expert uh, consultation to the Georgian government to be able to, for the Georgian government to be able to properly put in place the proposed reform. So, I mean, on the slide, we there's a better regulation package, which is uh, the package known to the Georgian and mostly to the European uh, colleagues, uh, which exists in the framework of the European Commission lawmaking. And basically, it uh, combines uh, different uh, instruments, different tools, as it's known, consultation procedure, impact assessment, monitoring assessment. In respect to Georgia, and I want—I don't want to be very detailed here. The, the slide I think is very informative. Basically, the the way the Georgia went on the regulatory reform is that it introduced the regulatory impact assessment in the organic law of Georgia or normative act. So it, there is not a soft law uh, solution here, but the, within the hard law and then on the normative acts within the hard law, there is a. Uh, base uh, and, uh, on the regulatory impact assessment and basically the um, government is uh, obliged to submit uh, the regulatory impact assessment the one of the efficient tool of evidence-based lawmaking only when this, so the point i'm making here is that there's a limited scope of regulatory impact assessment in uh, in the georgian system which basically uh, obliges government uh, obliges the, the only the government, uh, when it uh, proposes the, the law to uh, back it up with uh, respective impact assessment, um, only if uh, uh, only if the government is uh, in a position to do so. Then there's a wide list of exceptions that's provided in the law. I'm not going to, to read it, and I'm not going to uh, detail, de discuss it in detail. But the point is that only. Uh, uh, the government has a wide discretion in deciding whether to go with the regulatory impact assessments, whether to open up uh, the policy making, the legislative policy making, uh, and whether to 
uh, include uh, as many stakeholders as possible, whether to conduct as thorough research as possible uh, while introducing a particular legislative solutions. Um, on the, the, as regards the substance of the regulatory, uh, regulatory impact assessment, there is a, um, a wide, uh, wide range of uh, substance that should be part of the regulatory impact assessment and it, the, and it may be assessed positively which is obviously uh, very much uh, dependent and very much uh, is a source of inspiration of the European practice and uh, this is a, if one may argue if the, the regulatory impact assessment tool is applied uh, in the Georgian system the content of it is really uh, very th thorough and straightforward, and should be and should be in, and in fact effective in the Georgian experience. Um, and uh, on, from the on the substantive side, substantive side also, the principles of uh, proportionality, as already discussed in the normative framework of the first couple of chapters: transparency, efficiency, and feasibility. And uh, interestingly, the respect for sustainable development goals as which is also obviously relevant in the current uh, United Nations uh, sustainable development agenda all over the world. Um, and uh, in the conclusion, very briefly, uh, my, the point of my paper is basically that if the regulatory impact assessment is implemented properly, the takeaway from uh, the, the, the argument is that if it is applied properly and if it is, if the government and if the policymakers in uh, Georgia decide to resort to this tool as often as necessary and as often as possible, uh, obviously depending on the uh, on the importance or, or on the substance of the reform, the substance of the legislative solution proposed, it will be uh, a useful tool to help to improve the quality of legislation. And it will obviously provide inclusiveness of uh, in, the, in the course of the policy making, it will uh, make uh, the proposed laws and the adopted laws more informed in terms of evidence base and evidence and reason and also uh, and very and the last point here on the slide is very relevant uh, in georgia and uh, i imagine in the other parts of the eastern european countries it will help uh, the government the uh, policy making policy makers to uh, be to get the ever needed legitimacy and to ensure the stability of laws and to basically uh, uh, achieve the higher levels of compliance of laws that is uh, basically um, the found, uh, basically one of the foundational requirements of the rule of law principle and also very much needed in uh, in, the, in uh, our countries in the in Georgia and I imagine in uh, other countries of Eastern Europe. Now I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, George, for a very uh, interesting and elaborate presentation. I would like to remind that tomorrow, during the second day of the conference, related matters on good governance and rule of law will be discussed. So we would like to invite everyone to join that debate as well. Uh, but for now, as a good tradition, question time. My colleagues, Eva, Piero, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anastasia. Uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, reading your paper, I've noticed that uh, you have referred very often to the jurisprudence of the Bundesverfassungsgericht, to the jurisprudence of the German Constitutional Court and its influence on uh, Georgia or other countries, which uh, is, uh, is very interesting for us because the topic of dialogue uh, among different courts was very much in the spotlight of the um, Conference on Human Rights, annual Conference on Human Rights that we had on the 27th of November here at the Riga Graduate School uh, of Law. Um, could you elaborate a little bit, maybe more, on this dialogue uh, between uh, national and maybe also international courts, if they are uh, involved in um, 
uh, and its work on the idea of rational uh, lawmaking. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor. Uh, this is a truly a very interesting question. Uh, in uh, what I imagine, I can talk about Georgian experience. Uh, Georgia, in um, Georgia, the Georgian Constitutional Court is basically very much keen to uh, apply to resort to the international practice, both uh, the practice of uh, regional and international courts, I mean, the European Court of Human Rights or the Court of Justice or the, of the European Union, but also to the authoritative national tribunals and German constitutional court is obviously one of the uh, authority, most authoritative and uh, basically um, successful and strong constitutional uh, review bodies uh, all over the world, uh, and the, obviously the, the the extensive case law, extensive jurisprudence it has developed over the decades is very much uh, deserves uh, the is very much practical in uh, other countries in the countries like Georgia where um, the constitutional uh, jurisprudence has developed. Uh, to a fair degree, but also it still is in the process of transition and still is in the process of development. Uh, in relation to the rational lawmaking, I have to say that there is not much experience in the Georgian constitutional jurisprudence, not at all, not yet at least, because it has been just, it's, it hasn't even been a year since the, the, the regulatory reform has been introduced in Georgia. So uh, the, the uh, process-based review as it is, um, uh, indicated in the, the European Academia, uh, the process-based review, the rationality review, uh, or uh, another term is the very, there's no, not much case law in the Georgian jurisprudence. Although, and however, there's a, a very rich jurisprudence in relation to the principle of proportionality. And proportionality, as uh, I have already uh, discussed, is the very principle which would potentially would help the Georgian Constitutional Court to develop the existing, to develop the, its practice of, on the principle of proportionality towards uh, potentially, obviously there's no such complaint yet in the Georgian uh, Constitutional oh. Court to, towards uh, elaborating the standards on rational or lawmaking in uh, the context of uh, Georgian uh, policymaking. Uh, thank you for your presentation. If I may ask you a question, uh, do the regulatory impact assessments contain a separate chapter on Georgia's international commitments and Georgia's international obligations? And could you please comment on that? Uh, thank you. This is a, truly a very important and relevant question in, in the context of Georgia in particular because it uh, strives to uh, join eventually the European Union and the Euro-Atlantic Euro um, um, organizations. Uh, I can say with uh, confidence that there is a specific, uh, it's not a chapter, but rather a specific requirement, which is part of the legislative uh, report, uh, which is the, the part of the uh, um, in explanatory note of uh, the proposed uh, legislation, of, and it relates to every legislation, all the uh, draft laws that are introduced in the parliament or um, to the uh, draft uh, normative acts as part of the government uh, law rulemaking uh, process. So uh, it is not only a part of the uh, regulatory impact assessment, which is a larger and more thorough um, analysis uh, of uh, the proposed uh, legislative reform, but it, it is true, it is part of the le le every legislation, and not covered, even not covered by the regulatory impact assessment. Um, uh, it is part of every legislation that are introduced in Parliament. Uh, 
Um, however, here um, also with the, the I mean, one, even though I said that it's part of the um, of every legislation, in relation to um, uh, explanatory notes uh, that are part of the draft laws, the analysis is not as uh, thorough, proper, or uh, full in its nature than it should be and uh, then it is uh, uh, with RIA in the regulatory impact assessment. So in fact, it's my opinion here, in fact, in um, practice, the, um, um, the, the note, the explanatory note is not as effective in providing the background analysis, background uh, factual uh, analysis on the international commitments of Georgia as it would be in, uh, in the case of the regulatory impact assessment. Thank you for the interesting questions and for your answers too.